so it's actually mostly SciPy, some little bit of scikit-learn, and uh, it's analysis of historical uh, rainfall records um, in Western Canada because that happened to be the area that I did my PhD on, and this was a side project. Um, however, you all remember, or those who are from Toronto, and two years ago we had a big flood here, and that was one of these um, rare uh, um, heavy rainfall events. And we sort of, this talk is sort of about uh, characterizing these statistically. Um, I'm not going into the projection part. Uh, that was also a part of my previous work with climate models. Um, but this is just on observations. Uh, on And whether these kind of events are actually due to climate change is a matter of debate. And we are, the community is not really sure um, what the what is actually to be expected, and attributing any particular event because of the high variability is impossible in any case. So, just as a uh, note. Um, the data that I'm discussing here is uh, Environment Canada weather stations in uh, Western Canada, all the red dots are the locations of weather stations. And this is just a picture of one of these. Uh, most of them are automated. And so if you take one station and you plot the, um, the, day, the day with the highest precipitation total uh, for each season, and do this for the summer season, so July, uh, June, July, August, and the one day with the highest uh, value, so that's like close to the upper 1th percentile, um, and you do this over, for example, a 40-year record, then you have 40 data points, and you make a histogram, uh, then for one station, you might get something like this. And if you look at this, you don't see a lot of structure here. Um, if you take another station, it looks uh, quite different, even though this is a station that's fairly close. And yet another station looks different again. Um, and the reason for this is that just the, the variability in the system is so high that 40 years of data is not really enough to characterize the distribution. And that's also why we can't really say very much uh, just from one climate model simulation. Um, so what you can do is you can just aggregate the data from different stations that are sort of similar. And I've done this here with 15 stations. That's, about four, uh, that's more than 500 data points here. And uh, then you get something that looks a little bit more regular. And if you do this now um, for different periods, for example, you would get sort of similar distributions. And it becomes relatively stable. Now, this is not a normal distribution. This is a different type of distribution. And from theoretical considerations, these kind of distributions follow the generalized extreme value family of distributions. And they, they have three parameters. It's a scale and a location parameter that's like mean and variance, and then a shape parameter that determines how it looks like. Um, now, these are implemented in SciPy very conveniently. And so in the SciPy stats module, you, you can just define the parameters and then you can uh, import the GV object, and uh, it has a method to just create random samples, for example. It, can, uh, it has a fit function where you can, f based on data, you can determine the, the parameters of the distribution, or it also has uh, methods to produce a, the uh, probability density function or the cumulative distribution function. So this is very easy to use with SciPy stats, and it, it also has lots of other distributions in there as well. And if we use that to fit a distribution to the data, um, if we take all the data all over British Columbia, for example, that, uh, th so this is um, 49 stations, uh, this fits beautifully. It exactly follows the theoretically expected distribution. And this, this is just the, the power of the statistics because there's so many data points and the theoretical model is quite sound. So a very good fit. And this is for summer. Now, we, we can analyze two different periods and uh, compare there are any differences. And this is sort of like the climate change detection task. And here we have a period from 1920 to 1960, and then from 1970 to 2010. And what we can see is that there is a slight shift towards higher extremes, which is sort of what, what you mostly also hear in the media and what most scientists also expect um, to be the response from climate change. Only that the shift in the mean is actually 7% over 50 years, which is very high. So probably not everything of that is actually climate change because we've only had about half a degree of warming over this period. However, when you do this for winter, 
um, the distribution doesn't fit at all. And you, you can even see this with your, with your eyes, but um, also, for example, a Komogorov Smirnov test, so this, this is just a, a statistical test, will, will show you that this is, um, you cannot get this kind of histogram from a GEV distribution. So what is wrong here? If you look at the precipitation climatology over Western Canada, uh, we see that there's a strong gradient. So th the red and yellow is very high precipitation and uh, the blue is intermediate and the uh, pink is a very low precipitation. So there's very low precip in the prairies and in the interior plateau and very high at the coast and generally high in the mountains and especially, of course, in the coast mountains. And so the reason is different stations are in different locations and um, when they have a higher mean precipitation, especially, so this is mostly in winter, right? In summer it's pretty even because it's more, more controlled by local processes. Um, but in winter you have a lot of uh, rain coming from the mountains, uh, coming from, uh, so rain coming in from the sea and running out at the mountains. So these stations obviously don't have the same parent distribution. So lumping them together actually violates basic statistical assumptions. So these data are not, they're just, the samples are just not drawn from the same parent distribution. And so what can we do to fix this? Basically we have to group stations in a sensible way uh, so that we can assume that they come, that the data comes from the same parent distribution. And for this we can use clustering algorithms from, from scikit-learn. So these are the station locations again that I've showed before. Um, we can cluster them based on summer and winter precipitation and also snow, sort of the snow is served as a proxy for temperature. And so this is sort of to ensure that they have the same type of climate. You can also use different um, variables, like you could even cluster them according to having the same extreme precipitation, but that's even, not even necessary. The algorithm I've used here is uh, k-means, and if you apply this, you get a very robust partitioning into stations. Um, so here, here I have uh, nine different categories. If you use a different algorithm, like a hierarchical algorithm, for example, it basically works exactly the same. You get the same result. This is, uh, this is pretty robust. And so uh, there, there are nine clusters. Some of them are very small, which are basically outliers. But I'll, I'll focus on two of these that you see here. And you can basically do the same analysis that we had before, just based on these two clusters. And so this, this is now for winter precipitation for the coast cluster with nine stations and for the uh, interior plateau cluster with uh, 15 stations. And now the fit is much better. Um, there is a bit more noise here because we have less data so it doesn't look as good as the fit over the entire province. Um, but now uh, there is no statistical um, deviation or no significant deviation from the expected theoretical result. So this fit, fits now well even in winter. And if we do the two periods again, um, we see, the, so this is, um, red is again the future, uh, or not the future, but the, the, the recent period, and blue is the uh, historical period. Um, at the coast, there's no significant increase at all. It looks a bit different, but it's no statistically significant difference, whereas um, at the, in the plateau, there's actually a decrease. And this is actually not what we generally expect from climate change. But in winter, the uh, precipitation is strongly dominated by large-scale weather and especially by ocean activity. And um, this is likely due to uh, differences in the ocean surface temperature that are sort of local. So we are only looking at a small region here, so this is not representative. Okay. And we can do the same for summer with using the two clusters again. And here we see that, as in winter, in, there's no change at the coast actually, um, but most of the change was really dominated by uh, the plateau. So as a summary, um, increase in summer at, at the plateau and a decrease in winter and no change at the coast. And we can use the, uh, the GEV from SciPy to do all these estimations and we can use a clustering algorithm from scikit-learn. Why we use Python? IPython notebooks are pretty useful for this type of analysis and at the same time I can use a lot of code that I've develop, developed for other purposes um, container classes for variables and data sets that keep track of metadata um, yeah, to, to uh, reuse uh, co um, code and uh, also use it for other purposes. And there's just a list of the libraries I've used. Okay.
Do we have time for a question? Uh, we have time for, say, one quick question. Um, so you have the coastal region, and then you have the plateau. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't this suggest that something is happening in those mountains that is right in between both of them? And that there is some kind of weather process that is either changing or it's taking more water, I guess, in the winter right. out of the system? Right. Um, Right. It, it, one thing that could happen, for example, is that the amount, so the amount of water that comes over the mountains could change. And that could be due to a change in the angle between the mountains and the wind. Yeah. Yeah. So this has to do with large scale weather processes. Yes. And it, it is likely not because of climate change as such. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. Exactly. For example, El Nino, also the PDO, the PNA. So there are different effects that are like sea, sea level pressure. Uh, changes that affect the wind direction relative to the mountains. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Andre. Um